So we were considering Rademacher marker averages and just to, to drive the point home of what they look like so that you can get that in your head. This is a Rademacher marker average, right? And you can also look at uh, an LP average or a peak moment or whatever you want to call it, which is this for P not necessarily equal to one. Let's not take infinity. That's going to cause us problems. And this is another measure of a, a Rademacher marker average, which is reasonable and which might give us some good information. And if you take this as your definition of a Rademacher marker average and you look at the proof we did of the contraction principle, you see that actually the contraction principle still holds. We just use a triangle inequality and some convexity. And by putting this P here, we don't lose anything. We can still do the contraction principle and all's good. But I'm not going to phrase that as a as a theorem because it turns out these are independent of P. That's a bit of a miracle. Okay, they're independent of P up to a constant that depends on P and the constant blows up as P approaches infinity. But you know, if we're going to get into this philosophy of not caring about irrelevant constants out the front, these things are independent of P. I'll state the theorem properly because I do need to say this properly. This is a an even deeper theorem than the contraction principle. This one is actually a really deep theorem. The proof is not easy. It's also by Kahan. It's usually called the Kahan Kinchin inequality or inequalities. Sometimes it's called Kinchin Kahan. It depends on whether you want to go in chronological order or alphabetical order. I'm going to go alphabetical. So let's take a Banach space X and a Rademacher sequence. On some probability space, of course. Let me fix my screen up. Yep. Then for all P and Q between one and infinity, very quick side note, I'm saying they're greater than or equal to one. This also works for P and Q less than one, greater than zero, but let's not talk about that. For P, all P and Q, there exists, yeah, I'll state it with the constant. There exists a constant, which is sometimes called Kappa PQ. It has a name, at least in the book analysis and Barnack spaces, let's call it Kappa PQ. Such that for all finite sequences xn, say going from x from zero up to capital N, whatever that is, in the Barnack space, you have, uh, do I want to write it this way? Yes, I do. Your Rademacher average with peak power. So your LP Rademacher marker average is less than or equal to that constant Kappa PQ times the Rademacher marker average with power Q. So this constant here, Kappa PQ, it's, it doesn't depend on the Rademacher marker sequence. It doesn't depend Okay, I have, I've done my quantifiers wrong. I should have put, there exists kappa PQ, less than infinity, such that. This constant doesn't depend on the Barnack space. It doesn't depend on the Rademacher sequence. It doesn't depend on the finite sequence in X. It doesn't depend on how many elements are in that sequence. It doesn't depend on anything. It doesn't depend on any of these irrelevant parameters, right? So how can we write that in the notation that I just introduced? I'm going to introduce two new bits of notation here. One is that I'm going to write this Rademacher marker average directly as an LP norm on the probability space instead of writing out the expectation. That's a little bit quicker. And then this is less than or equal to with some constant that depends on P and Q, but nothing else. Then we have the LQ norm of the Rademacher zone. 
and that's a better way to write this property. But sometimes you feel like writing out the, the expectation here and the peak powers, you know, sometimes you want to do that. Sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes it's better to just say we're working on block spaces on the probability space. You know, we're adults, we can do that. We've got options on how we can write this. And when I write it like this, I'm emphasizing, I don't really care what that constant is. It depends on P and Q, but it's irrelevant to us. And sometimes you want to prove things with sharp constants, like we were saying in the break. And then you want to actually, you know, carry around this kappa PQ and see how it changes when you do your estimates. But for everything we do, we don't really care. We're just happy that there's a constant. That's the Kahn Kinchin theorem. And it's proof. There are two well known proofs of this. Both of them are quite hard. We're going to do one of them. I think it's the easier one. And it's, at least for this course, the more natural one. Just make a note about the proof method. One proof method, the one we're not going to do, goes by what's called hypercontractivity of the heat semigroup. Uh, on the discrete cube or the Hamming cube. I just wanted to say that in case anybody knows about these things, about the Hamming cube or the heat semigroup on that. And this is a really deep probabilistic proof that goes through all sorts of, well, not really, it doesn't go through all sorts, but relates to all sorts of nice probabilistic properties of random variables on the Hamming cube or whatever, plus minus one valued random variables. It, it's deep, it's a difficult proof. It involves some inequalities that you prove out of nowhere that seem irrelevant and then bang, you have a theorem. I'm not gonna do that proof because I feel it just doesn't touch enough on other things we want to do. I'd have to introduce a bunch of stuff that's only used for that and then move on. The proof that we will do uses the John Nirenberg inequality. For stochastic processes. The proof is, I think, a little bit longer than the other one. It doesn't introduce any of the nice hypercontractivity stuff, but it tells us something about stochastic processes that we could use later on, actually, in Barnack valued analysis. So if you've done harmonic analysis and you know BMO spaces and you know the John Nirenberg inequality relating to that, you have BMO and you measure your mean oscillation, but you can measure that mean oscillation in any LP norm you like. You don't have to just take an L1 mean. This is what the John Nirenberg inequality in, for BMO spaces would tell you for functions. And there's a corresponding John Nirenberg inequality for general stochastic processes that says when you measure their oscillation in a certain sense in LQ, it doesn't depend on Q. So this is directly a kind of PQ independence result that looks like Kahan Kinchin, which is another result that says, okay, you can measure this thing in LP, you can measure this thing in LQ, it doesn't make a difference. So at least this method of proof using John Nirenberg is more clearly related to the theorem we want to prove. Maybe it's less subtle because it doesn't use the hypercontractivity business, which is subtle for whole different reasons. But anyway, we're gonna do it that way. We're not gonna prove it today, it takes too long. In fact, I'm not even going to start the proof today because it's going to take an entire lecture, possibly more. Instead, I'm going to talk about some consequences of this theorem, the kahan kinchin inequalities, just so that at least we have some idea of how we can use it before we try to prove it. So consequences of I want to waste a, a minute and tell a, the one story I have about Kahan because I didn't know him personally. He was a, one of the, the great French mathematicians who died a few years ago at a quite old age. He did, he did well. And he was in my research group when I was doing my PhD. So he was at the, the weekly seminar in harmonic analysis. And without fail, he would come to the seminar, promptly fall asleep, 
wake up pretty much just before the end and then ask a really good question. <laughs> and yeah, I admired him for that. Although I didn't know him personally, I thought, yeah, he's, he clearly, he, he can go to seminars in his sleep. He's got it down. Okay. All right. Let's prove some consequences of this. First one. Consider a sequence X dot in a Banach space X. Then for all P and Q between one and infinity, you can even go less than one, as I said, the Rada marker sum summing over all of the natural numbers with respect to some Rada marker sequence doesn't depend which doesn't matter which one you take. This Rademacher sum converges in LP of omega, if and only if it converges in LQ. Straightforward, right? I mean, the whole thing is that LP norms and LQ norms of Rademacher sums should be doing the same thing. So convergence in LP shouldn't depend on which P you take. And just to show directly how that comes from that estimate, I'm going to do the proof. It's quite quick. Uh, so we want to show that the, if we want to show convergence in LP, what we need to show is that the limb soup is N and M go to infinity of the, the partial sum from N up to M. So in LP, we want to show that this limb soup is zero as N and M go out to the end of the sequence. This is equivalent to convergence of the series in LP. Yeah. But Kahan Kinchin says that this limb soup of the average, I won't write it out, of the Rademacher sum is less than or equal to up to a constant that we don't care about less than or equal to the limb soup with LQ norm. And that's zero if we assume convergence in LQ. So if we have LQ convergence, so LQ convergence implies LP convergence, great. This also emphasizes this use of this notation here. If we're talking about a, a series or a sequence that's going to zero and we multiply the values by some constant that's independent of everything that we don't care about, it still goes to zero, right? The fact that there's an irrelevant constant there doesn't make a difference. It, it vanishes. It does not help us to know what that constant is. So that's simple enough. That's the proof there. So convergence of a writer marker sum, you can talk about it in LP and it doesn't matter what P is. The next consequence, which is uh, a famous one. The reason that the Kahan Kinchin theorem has Kinchin's name in it. Kinchin's inequality, which is the, the classic Kinchin inequality before Kahan came along. Let H be a Hilbert space. And let H bullet be a sequence in the Hilbert space. Then for all P between one and infinity, not including infinity, your, your LP writer marker average of the vectors HN, norms in H, take the LP norms, is equivalent with a constant depending on P that we don't care about to the, the norm of the sequence H in little L2. So just supposing you didn't know the kahan kinchin inequality, supposing you only knew this, and this is how Kinchin saw it, this tells you that the LP Rademacher averages are all equivalent. But not only that, it tells you what they're equivalent to. 
<laughs> they're equivalent to something that is not a Rada marker average. It's purely just an L2 norm. Right. This is one reason that we think of Rada marker averages as being like an analog of an L2 norm, actually, because in the Hilbert case, you get an L2 norm. Yeah. Uh, in particular, if you take a, a scalar sequence, and I think this really is the case that Kinchin worked in, you can just take the, the absolute value here of the scalar. So this is now a scalar Rader marker average. This is equivalent with a constant depending on P to the L2 norm of the sequence. Just taking the Hilbert space in the previous part to be the scalar field. And this is actually quite useful for other reasons. It, often you really, you care about the L2 norm of a sequence. Like when you're dealing with L2 norms, this tells you I can replace my L2 norm with this Rademacher average and then I can do some probabilistic tricks that maybe I couldn't have seen when I was just working on L2. And it does get used actually. It's a useful thing. Let's prove it. Proof's not hard. Do it anyway. Let's start with the left-hand side. And let's compute the, the square of the left-hand side, just to make our notation a little bit easier in the next steps. So this is equivalent with a constant depending on P by Kahan Kinchin to, so we can take the LP Rademacher average and replace it with an L2 Rademacher average for free, up to a constant that doesn't matter. So sum over N, epsilon N, HN, in the Hilbert space H squared. And then I would have to replace this, this P here with a two, but I'd get a two on two and that's one. So I don't have to write it. That's why we squared the thing. Now, if you're good at Hilbert spaces and probability, you can see that we're done, but let me write out the steps. This is a, the expectation is just an integral over the probability space. And we can write the norm squared in the Hilbert space as the inner product of the vector with itself. So let's let this angle bracket be the inner product in H. We have the vector we're taking the norm of. We have again, the vector we're taking the norm of, but let's put a different letter to emphasize that we have two separate sums going on here. Uh, I should say this is epsilon of omega because we have our variable omega lying around now. We can then take out the sums. So it's a sum in N and M, epsilon N omega, epsilon M omega. Just in case we're in a complex Hilbert space, let's put a conjugate, but this thing's plus or minus one. So the conjugate doesn't do anything. And we have the inner product of HN with HM integrating over the probability space. And this inner product here doesn't depend on omega. Great, okay. So we can take this sum out because the, everything else doesn't depend on N and M. We have the sum of N and M of the expectation of epsilon N, epsilon M. Again, that conjugate doesn't do anything. In a product of HN and HN. And what do we know about this here? That should be red. What do we know about this? Epsilon's a Rademacher sequence. So the Rademacher variables that it consists of are mutually independent. So when you integrate the product of two of them, it's just the product of the integral. So this expectation of epsilon n, epsilon m is expectation of epsilon m, expectation of epsilon m. And both of these expectations are zero because they have plus one or minus one equal probability unless n equals m. So let me write this out properly. This equals zero if n is not equal to m. And if n equals m, we have the expectation of a Rada market variable squared. But these are plus minus one valued. So the square is just a constant one random variable. And that's got expected value one. Yeah. So we have a, a Dirac delta here, Dirac nm, which means we only see the diagonal term. And we can write hn, hn. And what's this? This is the norm of hn squared.
And this is what we wanted to show because we were looking at the square from the beginning. Got this two here. Yeah, so for, for Hilbert spaces, when you have a Rademacher average, you just exploit the orthogonality of Rademacher variables because they are independent random variables. So they're orthogonal. That's what independence is, it's orthogonality. And then you use the fact that you have an inner product in your Hilbert space to work with, and you can compute norms from that easily. But yeah, we did need uh, to give a, a really small overview of this proof. What we're doing is we say, okay, this LP rider micro average, it's an L2 rider micro average. And then you're in a Hilbert setting. <laughs> yeah. If you have um, P equals two, then the constant here is one. Yeah. So that was not so hard. Um, that tells us what rider micro averages are doing in Hilbert spaces computing them explicitly. Let's do another similar thing. Instead of looking at Hilbert spaces, we're gonna look at LP spaces. So they're not Hilbert, but they're not abstract finite spaces. They're still something concrete. Let's take a Sigma finite measure space. And we take P greater than or equal to one. Then for all sequences, Fn, let's take an infinite sequence, why not? In LPS, so this is a, a scalar valued Lebesgue space here. This isn't a Bachner space. This is just functions in a Lebesgue space. So it's vectors in a Banach space. The Banach space is a Lebesgue space. The vectors are functions. For all sequences in that LP space, we can compute this Rademacher average of the vectors. Now the Banach space is LP. So this is an L1 norm in omega of an LP norm in S. I could put a, a Q here instead of a one. This could be Q. It wouldn't make a difference because of Kinshin Kahan. What is this? Up to a constant, depending on P, that doesn't matter. It is the LP norm of the following function. The square function of the sequence. And just to be clear what that function is, this is a function of the variable S and it's given in this way. And these quantities just come up constantly in harmonic analysis and sometimes in stochastic analysis, I don't know how often, but in harmonic analysis and in, in PDE, yeah, these square functions come up all the time. So a Rademacher average in LP is just a square function in LP. But what this is, just to write it in an equivalent way that gives a little bit of insight, this is the norm of the sequence F in the mixed norm space LP valued in little l2. So you have an LP norm on the outside and a little l2 norm on the inside. I'll come back to that later on and say the significance of that. First, we'll prove it. Starting with the left-hand side. And raising it to the peak power. Again, just to make things simple. The first step is to use Kahan Kinchin to replace that L1 average with an LP average. So we still have this LP norm here, but now we have a, a P on the inside. Then we'll have a one on P on the outside, but we're raising everything to the power P. So that becomes one. Uh, we write it out explicitly. We have a, an integral over omega, and then we write out the LP norm explicitly. So we have an integral over S. And what we're integrating is this quantity here. F N S. Everything is to the pth power. We have the integral over S and the integral over omega. Uh, 
And now we're, we're faced with a double integral. So we blindly do Fabini because that's the only thing we can do. And we're allowed to do Fabini because our metric spaces, our measure spaces are sigma finite. And Fabini doesn't hold for non-sigma finite measure spaces. You have to keep that in mind. So integral over omega, integral over S. And what we do is we look just at the integral on the inside, we fix S. So now these Fn of S's are now just constants. Whoop, my headphone fell out. Excuse me. And what can we do here? Well, we only know how to do one thing. First, let's just write it out as an, using the probabilistic terminology, because that's what is a little bit more natural here. P power, yep, d mu s. And let's use Kahan's inequality, uh, Kinchin's inequality, sorry. The one we just proved before that says a, a Rademacher average in a Hilbert space, in this case, a Rademacher average of scalars is just a little L2 norm. So we have the integral over S and this little L2 norm here. And that was the right-hand side that we had before. This is the LP norm of the square function to the P power, because everything was to the P power from the beginning. That's all. Also not too hard, just using some, you know, Kahan, Kinchin stuff. So really we use Kahan, Kinchin twice there because we use Kinchin's inequality, which is just Kahan, Kinchin for the scalar field. So I said I'd say the significance of this, this little part here, When you take a mixed norm like this, so you have a sequence of functions f and you measure that in the mixed norm LP of the measure space, little l2 in the sequence variable. So when you take a square function in LP, this is equal to the L1 norm in, well, let me put in some Rademacher variables. Well, that won't make sense. We can write this as a mixed norm L1 of omega, the probability space variable valued in LP of S. That's just rewriting the left-hand side that we had before. That's not equality, that's with a constant depending on P. And we could freely put in a Q here using Kahan Kinchin again, or just in a different way. This norm here, we're gonna introduce later on and discuss in a little bit more detail is what you call a Rademacher norm. So it's a norm of a Rademacher average. This is what we call epsilon of LPS. This epsilon means take a Rademacher average, do it in any LQ you like. I mean, pick Q equals one if you want, but it doesn't matter which Q you take and take the norm of that Rademacher average. What this is telling you is that this Rademacher norm this Rademacher space associated with LPS is LPS valued in L2. And this space comes up naturally as a space corresponding to square functions, which are important in harmonic analysis and PDE. And it comes up when you're looking, well, we were looking at LP valued functions, but when we look at functions valued in a Banach space X, and X is just an abstract Banach space. It has no function structure. It's just a space of vectors. We don't have any sense of the space X valued in L2. That makes no sense. We can't form square functions of, of vectors. We can't take this. We can't form this quantity here. We can't take absolute values of vectors. We certainly can't raise that absolute value to a power two and so on. This has no sense for general vectors. So there's no space X of L2, but there is a space epsilon of X, which is just taking a Rademacher average valued in X. We're gonna look at that in a bit more detail after we prove the Kahan-Kinchin inequality, 
but these are called router market spaces. And the whole upshot of this is when you're doing harmonic analysis or PDE and you're doing, you have a vector valued function and you want to form a square function, but you can't do it, you take a router marker average instead. And that's going to work. Okay, this doesn't tell you it's going to work, but I'll tell you it's going to work. <laughs> it's kind of the only option. This is ultimately why we look at router marker averages, because we find ourselves having to look at square functions and the router marker average is the only thing that works. Cool. So if you want, you can think of epsilon of x, you know, router marker average in x is actually being some sort of square function inside x, if you're familiar with square functions. It's the right way to think of them. All right. What about taking functions into x whose norm is square summable? Would that, that will give, give something you similar something. or would that, that be gives you something similar? It's and it sometimes works, but it depends on the geometry of the Barnock space whether that's the right thing. Okay. Yeah, you can look at the space L2 valued in X, for example. And that's sometimes a reasonable space to work in. Basically, there's going to be theorems later on saying that the Rada marker space epsilon x is always going to be the right space. Like everything is going to work in this space. And then you can ask, well, hang on, is it going to be equal to L2? This turns out to only be true when x is isomorphic to a Hilbert space. And in general, maybe you can say, okay, maybe there's a containment of this one in that one or this one in that one. And these are the properties of type two and co-type two of X, which X may or may not have. So if your Barnack space is good enough, you can replace the router marker average with an L2 norm and use L2 techniques, but it's, it's usually not good enough, right? But in full generality, you can work with the router marker space and it's generally gonna work. Particularly if your space is UMD, then everything is gonna work great. Thank you. Little side note, when you take LP, as your x, you're always going to have one of the two inclusions, depending on whether p is less than or greater than two. So you, LPs are nice enough to have a comparison between the L2 and the router market space, but you're never going to have both of them unless p is two. Yep. Yeah, it's a fair question. I can't really explain why just using L2 doesn't work, but we'll get some feeling for it as we go. Just trust me that it doesn't work unless X is a Hilbert space. All right, we've still got 10 minutes. I'm not gonna prove anything in this 10 minutes, but I'll tell you about the John Nirenberg inequality. So just to remind ourselves, what do we need to prove? We're gonna to need to prove these Kahn Kinchin inequalities because they're so important. Everything we just did in that last half hour or so depended on this Kahn Kinchin, but we need to prove it. As I said, it's deep. We're gonna use the John Nuremberg inequality. I will quickly tell you what the John Nuremberg inequality is, give a rough sketch of how you get Kahn Kinchin from it, and then we're gonna run out of time. So let's look at the John Nuremberg. And just to make clear, John and Nirenberg are two separate people. Uh, John Nirenberg for stochastic processes. For a process, stochastic process F bullet, valued in a Barnack space X. I'll scroll, give myself full space. For a process valued in X, adapted to some filtration. a bullet, we define a certain measure of oscillation there are many ways to measure what oscillation is this is just one of them and we, we don't give it a fancy name or anything we just call it star q um, what is q q is between one and infinity let me write out the definition then we can discuss it. Supremum over k and n, k less than or equal to n. Supremum of sets A in the filtration AK plus. This just means that the 
the measure of A is positive. That's what that plus means. We did the same notation in the right on nicotine proof on Tuesday. We take an average over A. So this is the integral over A divided by the measure of A. That's what this integral with the bar means, if you haven't seen that. We take Fn. So N is the larger index. N is greater than or equal to K. Fn minus Fk minus one. For technical reasons, it's K minus one and not K. I didn't say this was simple. Integrate this in LQ over omega. One on Q. Yeah. This is a measure of oscillation. Why is this a measure of oscillation? We're on a set A, which is in AK. And we're comparing, think of this as comparing Fn to Fk minus one. Fk minus one, because if you think of F as being a, a martingale, for example, we don't assume F is a martingale, but if it were, Fk minus one would be a conditional expectation of Fn with respect to AK minus one. And yeah, it is, it's sort of technical, but you should think of FK minus one as sort of representing the average of F on A because A is in AK. I know it's not K minus one, just bear with me. And we're looking at FN. So like a more refined image of F and we're comparing it's how it deviates from this average over this set A. We're measuring it in LQ because why not? We've got to measure it somewhere. And we take the supremum over all of all of these averages over all of the relevant sets and indices. It's confusing. Yeah. But we'll get used to it. And if you're used to BMO spaces, this is kind of like measuring the mean oscillation on, on all balls, for example, or all cubes or something like that. That's what this supremum over all of the relevant sets here is doing. We can write it slightly differently. We can write supremum k less than or equal to n, supremum a in a k plus. This average here we could write as an expectation of fn minus fk minus one to the qth power. And this is like a conditional expectation on a, just to use the probabilistic notation. I haven't introduced that notation, but it's like given the event a, it's the expectation of this, right? I don't know if that helps anybody, but that's another way to think about it. What the John Nirenberg inequality says. So John Nirenberg. For all P and Q in the range above for all F as above, you have that the, these two measures of oscillation are equivalent. So we have this way of measuring the oscillation in a sense of the process F. And this, this is all with respect to the filtration A. I mean, F can be adapted to various different filtrations, but this measure here actually depends explicitly on the filtration you choose. You don't say it in the notation, but it does depend on that. You can choose to measure the oscillation with respect to P or with respect to Q, and you get an equivalent quantity. You'll get constants that only depend on P and Q. Oh, sorry, I didn't say what they were. I should be careful here. The constants depend on P and Q. They blow up as P or Q approaches infinity. Like you can't do this at, at infinity. But yeah, that's the John Nierberg inequality. The, the proof will take at least one whole lecture. Hopefully it only takes one. It'll take less than two, certainly. And how can we get Kahan Kinchin from this? The sketch of the proof. We need to fill in the details, but the sketch says that if you have a Rademacher average, actually let's, Let's make it an infinite one. I haven't really said how we can deal with infinite sets, but I did say that the convergence of an infinite Rader micro average is in LP is independent of P. Let's just deal with infinite ones. Let's just assume the convergence. So when we look at this in LP, what we're gonna do is identify this as one of these measures of oscillation. 
for a particular choice of f. Fn, let's write fk because we're gonna need no, f capital N, so we need another letter. Fn will be the sum from N up to capital N. This is gonna be the process we take. And proving that this Rada marker average is actually this measure of oscillation, it's, it's not obvious. It's not extremely hard, but you shouldn't, if you can just see that, then good for you. But no, I can't just see that. So once we have that, then John Nirenberg is going to do the rest of the work for us because we can change P to Q here up to a constant. And then we can say, okay, that's the Rader marker average running out of space. Let me scroll. Let's, yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's going to be the Rader marker average in LQ. Yeah, we go directly from one p independence result to another p independence result. It's just a matter of identifying the the Radomark average as one of these oscillation measures up here. As I said, not obvious, but it is true. And we have to choose the right filtration as well. I should I should have mentioned that for some filtration, but it's not a clever choice of filtration. It's the coordinate filtration coming from the the Radomark variables. And of course, what else is it going to be? So that's what we're going to do in the next lecture. I thought this would be a short lecture, but we're basically on time. This is nice. Okay. That's all I've got for today. So Tuesday, we'll come back to John Nirenberg and prove it. It's a, it's a nice argument. It's a sort of induction on scales thing, if you've seen that in harmonic analysis, but maybe not because that's hard. And yeah. Can I squeeze nice in a quick hmm? question, maybe? I yeah, have yeah, yeah, questions, of course. Sharp, which is I'll go for it, yeah. Um, so I can't help seeing uh, these these trees, delta separated trees. When you look at these uh, exactly these uh, expansions here, it looks like trees and this epsilon and plus minus one. So each time you branch into two, mm. is there a way of seeing maybe what we did last time as some endpoint of this business here, some L infinity endpoint maybe? I don't know. It just feels geometrically so similar. I mean, there we allowed to branch into several pieces here. We are branching into two only, but that may be a small technical. Similar. Yeah, what do we have here? This warrants a much longer discussion than we've got time yeah, for. Yeah, okay. <laughs> There's definitely something here. Well, then, I'm gonna, then, until 12 let me think yeah. about it for a bit and we'll maybe discuss it on Tuesday if you yeah, remind me on Tuesday. Okay. This is a. I think we could easily talk for an hour on this. Maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, there are certainly connections there, and I think that they're, they're not apparent. Like it's a bit deep. Like th this whole thing of looking at Martin girls in Barnack spaces, it goes very deep. Like, yeah, all sorts of connections. All right, thank I can't you. Give you yeah. a short answer. <laughs> I have to. I have to quit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>